Kamala Shamsi and Atish Tasir are travelers first, writers second. In her latest novel, A God in Every Stone, Kamala travels all the way to the First World War to capture a slice of the subcontinent's shared history. In his best-known work, Stranger to History, Atish travels to Pakistan to see who he might have been. Kamala lives between London and Karachi. Atish is London-born, Delhi-bred. Half of Kamala's family lives in India. Half of Atish's family lives in Pakistan. Both have strong mothers who spent both, most of their lives writing. Like some of their generation, partition for them is very much a living reality, not a distant memory. They write, they argue, they debate. Atish has written a letter to Pakistan, a country he half loves, hates. Kamala has written to India, or at least an idea of India, a country she loves for its Kutub Minar and Fab India. Beauty, brains, books. Ladies and gentlemen, I give to you Kamala Shamsi and Atish Tasir, letters from across the border. So it's Women's Day, but Atish is going to begin, right? And then Kamala. Take it away. Dear Pakistan, it was Firak that came to mind um, as I began this letter, some favorite lines of his, um, perhaps related to uh, our own Firak of some six or seven years ago. Muddatein guzri teri yaad bhi aai na hume. Muddatein guzri teri yaad bhi aai na hume. Aur hum bhool gaye ho tujhe. Aisa bhi nahi. Firak Gorakhpuri, the man known among the poets for having post persuaded Josh Malihabadi in 1958 to emigrate to Pakistan. Josh, who had been in jail with Nehru and who Nehru did his best to dissuade, came later to regret his decision bitterly. But it was too late, and he became like so many before him, and I'm willing now to put men as far apart as Manto and even Jinnah on this list, a victim of the idea of Pakistan. A victim of the idea of Pakistan. A heavy note, I know on which to begin this letter to you, but stay with me, Pakistan, for in some ways I feel our own trouble has also originated from this point. From the point of my having taken too literally, perhaps, the idea on which you were founded, and from my never having been able to see you as just a place where people lived and worked and loved and died, where they brought up children, but always and only as the emanation of an idea. And what an ugly idea it had seemed to me when I first came within your boundaries now some 10 or 12 years ago. I could never have been indifferent to you. Not indifferent, not impartial, not sentimental. I was not some English schoolboy traveler for whom the partition was a historical curiosity, nor was I simply, though I was this too, someone whose grandparents had come across in 1947 and who decades later was returning to the land of his forebearers. I could not lose myself in the happy, sad pain of the partition. I could not stand too long marveling at the pretty symmetries that must necessarily arise when the composite wholeness of a society is shattered. And that too, along the one line that the society's entire cultural evolution, from Baba Farid to Nanak to Bolesha, had been an exercise in helping efface. Irony of ironies, Punjab that had put in centuries of work in blurring the religious line, that had thrown up a whole religion and literature whose supreme aim was synthesis, was in the end, like those characters in novels possessed of a fatal flaw, divided along religious lines. What is it Orwell says of tragedy? A tragic situation exists precisely when virtue does not triumph, but when it is still felt that man is nobler than the forces which destroy him. 
and certainly the immense achievement of a composite society in Punjab, and perhaps in India more generally, was a far more noble thing than the force by which it was ultimately destroyed. I must confess, Pakistan, that when I first set eyes on you, I blamed you for that destruction. As much as Rushdie could not forgive Karachi for not being Bombay, I could not forgive you, Pakistan, for not being India. My biases were legion. I grew up in India with an Indian mother. My father was Pakistani. They were both Punjabis. The line that had gone through Punjab affected me directly. No nostalgia, no bittersweet ironies for me. I had a parent on one side and a parent on the other. I must have been among a handful of people I felt, especially of my generation, on whose life the partition still had a direct bearing. But my prejudices declared, as if there are any who have none, any who can be truly impartial on such a subject, I will say that when I step, first stepped across that border, my first thought was, what a bad idea. What a bad idea, I thought, to lose the interlocking wholeness of a diverse society, an achievement centuries in the making, for what felt to me at first sight like a Muslim neighborhood in India, but without end. Almost as if Chandni Chok or Mahim were to declare themselves independent countries. And initially, it was really only this that stood out, your endless homogeneity. What did the poet say on returning from a trip on your side? Acha mulk hai, musulman bahut hai. Otherwise, it should be said, for the man crossing that border on foot in 2002, the, country, the two countries look dismayingly the same. Vai nange, gande, bhuke, jahil log, on both sides of the border. But this, naturally, was not all. For you, Pakistan, were not simply a place where a lot of Muslims lived. You are, or were at least, a concept, an idea nation, a utopia to some. And founded thus, you had to, on some level, be regarded thus. You had to be seen against the high ideals on which you were founded. One could not travel in the nation conceived of as a homeland for all India's Muslims without keeping in mind that it had once been a utopia. I would like to define this concept of utopia in my own way. I would say that every man who ever dreamt up a utopia was animated far more by the wish to purge than to build. I would say, too, that the great flaw in any utopia is the intellectually lazy notion and one capable of unspeakable, of unspeakable violence that if only the society were cleansed or purged of some particular undesirable, undesirable element, the utopia would automatically come into being, that nothing more would need to be done. Here is Orwell again speaking of the left. Until well within living memory, the forces of the left in all countries were fighting against a tyranny which appeared to be invincible. And it was easy to assume that if only that particular tyranny, capitalism, could be overthrown, socialism would follow. Replace capitalism with India, tyranny with impurity, and I feel one has a picture of the faulty intellectual mechanism on which the religious state was founded. An ideologue in Karachi once upon being questioned hard about the shape and form of the Islamic utopia, once said to me, Islam doesn't depend on form. Form is not important. Essence is the main thing. If the essence is there, you can derive from it any kind of model. What he did not say, and what really lies behind this questing after essence and purity, is the business of getting rid of contamination. And that contamination, Pakistan, let's face it, was in your case, always and ever India or rather what remained of India in Pakistan. On its own, the idea of the Islamic Republic was inert. It could be boiled down into vague slogans like Pakistan ka matlab kya, la illa illallah. But when weaponized, when given teeth as it were, it meant getting rid of impurity. And that impurity was eternally India. The odd thing was that when I first began traveling seriously in your interior, I found that even after the passing of six decades, you were still incurably Indian. So in these early days of travel in Sindh and Punjab, I had the peculiar sensation of being in a place where India was everywhere, there in dress and language and religion and custom, but where its existence was a cause of discomfort. A man in Sindh might proudly say to me that he was no mere Muslim, he was a Rajput Muslim. When I questioned him as to how he, as a Muslim, could speak of caste, and this same man had spent the past two days trying to convince me that Pakistan and India were distinct in every way, from the way men spoke and dressed down to the weather, he replied, "Ye jat ki baat nahi hai, ye good or bad families ki baat hai. 
I bring these things up now, these endless contradictions, not to mock you, Pakistan, but because with time I have come to feel that there was something self-wounding in this experience of killing off what was integral to yourself. I wrote somewhere once that in trying to turn its back on it, its shared past with India, Pakistan turned its back on itself. But you might ask, why does that matter? Why is this killing off of oneself or one's past really a problem? In my view, for one reason alone, it will always lead to nihilism. I feel that any society that has at its heart this dialectic of violence and purity, this unquestioned purity, whose attainment depends on the eradication of impurity, will always finish by eating its tail. Places as these I once wrote need enemies the way other places need ideas. They are there to justify the failure of the ideology on which the nation was founded. It could be a minority one day, a festival or custom the next, an unruly governor. The target changes, but the mechanism is always the same. But Pakistan, you know all this already, and I began this letter by talking about victims of the idea of Pakistan, of which I consider myself one. I saw you too much in the light of the idea for which you were made, and because I reacted so strongly against this idea, found it mean-spirited and historically invalid, found it did violence to what I believed was the more generous, more capacious idea of India, I could not see beyond my dismay. But places, I realize now, are not simply the embodiment of ideas. They are, beyond the idea for which they were founded, comprised also of the people who live there, with or without the idea. I was reminded of this last month when after seven years of separation I returned to you. I don't want to get into the reasons for that separation. You know them only too well. Suffice to say that I was tired of blood, tired of your great spectacles of violence. But on returning one February day, on one February day a few weeks ago, I realized how happy I was to see you. I realized also that in seeing you the way I had, I had missed out on a lot. Missed out on life, as it were, on the human side. Crazy as it seems, I forgot that places are made up of people made up of supermarkets and play planets, of families and flowers and houses, of meals in front of televisions, of nephews who've grown up and of fathers who've been killed and buried, of a tiny but resilient middle class that has come into being against all odds, of grim, overcast winter days, of parties and laughter, of art exhibitions and literature, of defiance, of people who could have lived away in safer places but who moved back with so little to go on. Places are made up of hope and resistance and, yes, disappointment. And though this letter is not meant as an apologia, Pakistan, I will say that I felt a great grief at not having recorded enough of this in the past. I will say also that as much as I was happy to return to you, to feel again your warmth and amazing graciousness, it was not to a better or more hopeful place that I returned. I left six years ago, days after Benazir was killed, and what I came back to felt to me like a place, or an elite at least, in retreat. I could not help but notice the walls, the higher walls, the Normandy spikes and army checkpoints that now protected the camp from the unnamed and amorphous threat beyond. I could not help but notice, as I always have, the isolation of the drawing room classes, living at a dangerous remove from a place that had turned against them. And most of all, I could not help but notice the battle in the background against which the calm and placidity of Lahore was unnerving. Some people, Pakistan, had got hold of the idea for which you were founded, and they were using it now to fight you with. They sought an ever purer distillation of that idea, sought to take it to its logical conclusion. And what was frightening was that one sensed in that absurd atmosphere of talks with the Taliban that for all the threats of repercussions, there was no counter-idea strong enough to fight the extremists with. There was not even really, one felt, the will to fight. And in these moments, as we know only too well from our experience here, when a tiny but mi energized minority hijacks your founding principles and starts at gunpoint to tell you what you're really about, you need more than an army and a silent majority, Pakistan. You need an idea. This, above all else, was what I felt was lacking in the country I returned to. Strange thing. I, who had seen you once only as the emanation of an idea and had missed so much else as a result, found myself looking at a country that had been robbed of its animating idea. And as much as I had loathed that idea, I wondered now what you would be without it. 
what would you find, Pakistan, in place of faith to keep you going? And would it be enough, I could not help but ask myself, for the country which at the time of its conception had seemed to some like a promised land, like, de like deliverance, to finish simply by being a place where a lot of Muslims lived. As ever, Atish. Dear Atish, I know this is supposed to be a letter to India, but if I tried writing that, I'd spend the entire allotted time listing the different Indias that exist in my imagination, and then moving on to the problems of addressing the ones that live outside my imagination, and we'd never get beyond that. So I know you don't stand in for all of India. Let's face it, most days any one of us can barely represent ourselves, let alone a whole nation. But if you'll allow it, I'm going to use you as a focal point to address my thoughts. So that takes care of the who am I addressing question. But there's a que second question, and it's this. Which version of me is doing the addressing? The version of me which existed 10 years ago, the first time I came to India, would have written this differently. Not unlike you, I think. Then I would have looked everywhere and seen symbolism. I would have noted similarities and differences. I would find myself drawn to any conversation where Pakistan was being discussed, and I would have been slightly wounded when, in the middle of perfectly pleasant chatter, some barb against Pakistan would shoot out for no reason except that the other person couldn't contain their venom about my nation. Now, though, things are very different. I wasn't fully aware of the extent of this until I read a description of these letters online before writing mine, and saw they were being described as love letters. For goodness sake, I found myself thinking, why can't we write polite but mildly indifferent letters to each other? Wouldn't that be an improvement? So this is not a love letter. But I don't like to stray too far from the brief I've been given. It seems impolite. And I wouldn't want my many Indian relatives to think that the Pakistan side of the family has lost its manners. So let me at least look at some of the talking points that were sent to me to help shape this letter. One, can India and Pakistan converge over art, music, literature, and film? Well, I think we can converge over the fact that cricket should be on that list for starters. Of course, on either side of the border, many of us can converge on Abid Parveen and Vishal Bhardwaj, and I suspect some of you out there might even adore Shahid Afridi, though maybe not this week. <laughs> The question isn't, can we converge? It is, what might that convergence achieve? Some years ago, when researching a book about Japan in World War II, <clears throat> I came upon this detail. Many of the kamikaze pilots pasted into the cockpits of their death planes photographs of their favorite Hollywood actresses, even as they were on their way to kill as many Americans as possible. That, to me, says it all about the role of culture in bringing nations together. All those Indian movies we watched on my side of the border when I was growing up in the 80s, and all those PTV dramas you watched on this side, what did it do to bring the countries together? As human beings, we are capable of the most extraordinary cognitive dissonance. Or let's be more blunt about this. A writer from Pakistan is a writer. A terrorist from Pakistan is Pakistani. It works this way on both sides. My favorite variation on this, which I've encountered more than once in India, is you're not like most Pakistanis. You're a writer, so you see things differently. I'd like to point out terrorists tend to see things differently to a far greater degree than writers. Token point two. Can negative stereotypes of two nations reinforced by popular culture be erased? The facts about India and Pakistan, their interactions with and rhetoric about each other, their levels of misogyny, the bigotry unleashed on minorities, their government's treatment of its own troublesome citizens, these facts do more to create negative stereotypes than popular culture. Change the facts. Popular culture will follow. Point three. What has made Islam the most misunderstood religion in the world? Actually, I'm sure its followers will tell you Scientology is the most misunderstood religion in the world. 
I apologize. I feel a churlish note entering my voice, and I know this has a great deal to do with just coming to the end of a getting an Indian visa process, which seems designed to make Pakistanis feel mistrusted and unwelcome. And so every time I enter India, or am poised to enter India, it is with the ill feeling that the process provokes. And then I arrive here. I meet my friends, and I'm glad to be here. And then one of those barbed comments about Pakistan hits me, and I wonder why I'm bothering to return. But the next moment, I see Qutub Minar, or Fab India, and I'm glad to be here again, etc., etc. And on it goes. It's complicated. But really, that's also a bit of a lie. It doesn't feel particularly complicated anymore. Ten years of traveling back and forth, and I'm no longer searching for symbolism here or noting differences within similarities there. I don't compare India to Pakistan anymore. I compare India to the last time I was in India. I regard questions about Indo-Pak relations with a certain weariness, but little heat. Barbed comments about Pakistan hit me wherever in the world I go now, so India doesn't feel particularly different to anyone else in that regard. In short, none of it seems so weighty anymore. Please don't get me wrong. I understand the political, economic, and military significance of relations between the two countries. We have nuclear weapons and a history of war. That's not something to get complacent about. But a shift has happened within Pakistan in the last decade, moving India to the sidelines of the news reports. It's our western border we worry about more than our eastern border, and it's the Americans we love to hate more than the Indians. And frankly, our own troubles occupy so much of our mind that we think less of the relationship of India to Pakistan than we do of the relationship of Pakistan as it is, with Pakistan as we wish it were. Across the country, there are vastly, sometimes murderously, different ideas of how we wish it were. The age-old line that Pakistan defines itself in opposition to India might have once held some truth, but now the contest for defining Pakistan is all internal. None of this is something to be cheerful about, of course, but it does mean that India just doesn't occupy the kind of space in Pakistan's mind that it once used to. This is not true in every corridor of Pakistan, but it's true in most of them. A side note on this. Pakistanis have always claimed that India is far more obsessed with Pakistan than Pakistan is with India. It was only once I started coming here that I realized you believe the inverse. So here's another meaningless thing we can argue about if we want to. But let's not. A couple of weeks ago, I was at the Vaga border watching the flag-lowering ceremony. I'd been warned it was a terrible jingoistic sight. But as I watched the exceptionally tall soldiers stomping towards the border, their long strides and high kicks halfway between Monty Python's Ministry of Silly Walks and a Mark Morris dance performance, and as I listened to music blaring at an uncomfortably high volume so that our patriotic songs could drown out your patriotic songs, I realized I was witnessing a piece of theater. No one around me seemed genuinely gripped by any feeling. Everyone recognized they were witnessing a performance and knew their own role was to cheer and wave flags and shout Zindabad. And as soon as it was over, we all wandered out, drifting to roadside shops to buy bangles, posing for photographs next to the peacocks in their cages. There were no love or hate letters there, just some curiosity and a wish that it were easier to walk across the border and see the other side. It's what we try to do as writers. We walk across borders, see the other side, and then come back to interrogate how that changed us and what it meant. And look, Artish, for the first time in this letter, I feel I'm addressing you. We're both writers. I don't know how to be Pakistan talking to, be, talking to India here. I'm from Karachi. Lahore won't let me speak for it, for starters. But as writers, we know how it feels when the structure of a novel reveals itself to us. We know the pleasure and the sense of inadequacy of reading a brilliant book. We know what it feels like when we find the right word. Let's meet on that common ground and leave it to the politicians to reach that point of sanity which strives for polite but mildly indifferent relations over a state of hostility. It's their job to do that. Let's not shift responsibility one millimeter off their shoulders by pretending it's our job. Yours politely come down.
That is wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask you a few questions and then uh, open it to the floor. Um, Kamila, you talked about uh, the different ideas of India that exist in your imagination. Which is the one idea of India that strikes you now? No, it's interesting because I said there are different Indias. Right. Um, which is, I think, a separate thing to mm. different ideas of India. And when I said different Indias, you know, in that rightly way, I'm, I'm, I don't think of India as an idea. And I don't think of what the ideas of India are. So when I say different Indias, I mean, you know, my uncle is one India. And my best friend is another India. Um, and hostile media is a third India. So, I mean, you know, really I wasn't talking in terms of idea. And I don't, when I think about India, I don't know that I really think about the idea of India, although I know that's a, that's a popular kind of concept. But um, I suppose I'm just so aware that that my responses to it are manifold because the place is manifold. Um, so maybe that's the closest I can get to answering the question. Atish, you had or do have a very fixed idea of what Pakistan is, but you seem to have become more forgiving and you seem to have become more <coughs> uh, tolerant, shall we say? Uh, it's, not even, it's not even so much that uh, I still find uh, the premise for Pakistan, and, and there was a premise, I find that, uh, that that is still an abhorrent idea to me. But uh, what I realized was that, that, that it, had, it had entered my mind too deeply, and I'd, I'd started to see, like Kamala was talking about, everyone who travels, actually, you, the, the experience that you have cannot ever have that unitary quality. It has, it's, it's, it's full of a feeling of manyness. And uh, what changed was the acknowledgement that, that the life on the ground was a world away from that idea. You know? and, and that perhaps a time comes, especially as, if you're looking as a writer, to, to discard uh, the historical idea, whatever it was, and to concentrate uh, on the experience of people, because people are always the most interesting thing about traveling. What do you think comes in the way of peace between India and Pakistan, apart from Shahid Afridi? <laughs> I'm sure Shahid Afridi could bring us together if he wanted to. Although he'd probably miss <laughs> No, he'd have to bat for both of us. <laughs> he could probably do that in both for both of us. <laughs> no. But what do you think, uh, especially as young people, I mean, you're talking of a completely new generation. Mm. I mean, um, both of you really have no memories yeah. of partition except from your parents, or actually grandparents. Mm. You know, it's really interesting. One thing I found when I went to university in America, um, I went to a very small college. There were 1,600 people. So there were about mm. 15 desis in total, Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi. And everyone hung out together. And there was a way that everyone swarmed together. And I had friends at very large universities where there'd be 300 Pakistanis and 500 Indians, and they'd said there was a th state of enmity. Right. And I thought that was rather telling, um, that, that the more we see ourselves as part of this big group, this division occurs. Um, but really, you know, what is standing in the way, it is, I mean, as I said, it is a political question. Um, there has to be the political will on both sides to get, to get over it. Um, and there's no reason why the people of both sides, you know, I was in Karachi when the Indian cricket team came then, what was it, 2004, um, 2005, for the first time since I don't know when. Um, and I remember sitting in the stands, and this of course is going to go against me earlier saying what does culture do. I was sitting there with some friends, and we heard this cheer, and it was the loudest cheer I have ever heard in a cricket stadium, and that's saying something. And I looked around saying, what, what is that? Um, and there were a group of Indian spectators coming in carrying the largest Indian flag I've ever seen. I mean, there were about you know, 50 of them carrying it. And every Karachiwala stood up and applauded um, and carried on applauding <laughs> and carried on applauding through the match. It was, it was the most fantastic atmosphere I've ever been in. And Pakistan lost that match <laughs> in the last over. And it's the only time I've been in a stadium full of Pakistanis who didn't care that not only had they lost, but they'd lost to India, because everyone was in a really good mood. And, and I walked out there, and I mean, I, you thought a lot afterwards what that moment was, because none of us, myself included, went there thinking, we are going there in order to cheer when an Indian flag walks in, right? We went to watch a game of cricket and hope it went off. 
But what you really felt in that stadium in Karachi that day, and I don't know if it's true on this side, but it was certainly true there. What you, it wasn't that you felt an overwhelming love for India. What you felt was an exhaustion with hostility. What you felt was people in Karachi saying, come here and play your cricket. And, you know, come here and do your business. And come here and let us come there. Um, and this idea, we're just sick of it now. What is, what is going on? And I don't mean there's no anti-India feeling. And I don't mean that the rhetoric isn't effective. But there is this other current, and if you do change the rhetoric, and if you change what is happening politically, you will find an answering current. But it has to start with that shift in rhetoric and politics, because we also know that you can do all the cultural, you know, bhai bhai good feeling, and it will take one political event to completely derail that, which is why you need the political train on its track, and culture then following along and doing its work with it. Absolutely. Um, Atish, would you agree with that? Because politically... I would, I, I would add to that, which is that, and this has been my experience in a number of places like Kashmir as well as somewhere like Syria, that when a state of discord exists for long enough, the politics arranges itself with a vested interest in that discord continuing rather than in eradicating that discord. And I feel that, that every time... And now it's, it's somehow, in the kind of age we live in, it's uncontrollable. But every time interaction of that kind is allowed to happen between India and Pakistan, it's on one level threatening to the political classes, but it also completely, the, 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 people's ideas of, of what their hostility has been grounded on completely breaks down. And um, so... I'm, I'm completely of, of well, some, I think in part what Kamala was saying, that, that, that it would take a very imaginative leader to realize how much possibility there is in peace. Do you think we will get a government with an imaginative leader who can take a decision like that? This is a strange time to ask me such a question. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, the right time in um, a way. In, in a funny way, uh, in a funny way if, if, it's, if it's Modi you have in mind, yes. uh, I think that uh, Pakistan will probably be relieved to talk to someone like Modi. I think somebody like that uh, can, can, can sometimes actually think in, in very clear ways. And can be free of um, a very ugly politics, which I believe is the politics of the Congress Party, which is to play with Muslims within India. Kamila, would you agree with that? Honestly, of course, we're talking domestic politics. Yeah, yeah. honestly, I'm, you know, I, I feel I'm the least qualified person in the room to answer that. I don't know. I really hmm. don't know on, on, you know, I'm surprised to hear that, you know, Modi's not playing in any way with Muslims, but <laughs> okay. <laughs> he may just have his different ways of doing it. Um, the other point you mentioned in your letter, Kamila, then um, I'll open uh, the questions to the floor, uh, was that you said that India in many ways has become irrelevant to Pakistan. They're more bothered about what's happening on mm. their western border rather than mm. uh, the east. Uh, you know, uh, would you... Uh, I mean, would you like to... I wouldn't say irrelevant. Yeah. I mean, that's certainly going too far, but, but that the focus has shifted. Um, and there's the western border and links to the western border to Afghanistan and, and okay. that region, okay, um, is its internal problems. And there was, in fact, just the day I flew out of London, there was a... Um, Michal Hussain, the BBC presenter, had been in Pakistan talking to one of the generals at uh, army training colleges, and they said... What shifted is in our training now, rather than starting with a, you know, anti-India or, you know, getting everyone, getting all the soldiers into an anti-India frame of mind, it's the internal enemy that increasingly right. they're focusing on and getting the, the armed forces to think about as the enemy. Um, and I think that's been a very, um, again, it's very depressing for Pakistan yeah. that, that right. it's happening, but it does mean in terms of India, Pakistan, I wouldn't say... I mean, again, I don't say it's a positive change because it's an odd way to talk about internal terrorism, but it, it, it does mean that something has lowered in the temperature. Right. Atish, would you agree with that? I when felt, you went I this felt time? that. I felt uh, yeah. an amazing change within Pakistan. Not always a happy change because certainly within the educated classes, there's, just, there's a feeling, there's a kind of like last days of Rome feeling, and in some ways like people seem on one level besieged, but also a little exhausted. 
there was a there was a there was a certain kind of you know and certainly I remember this from someone like my father a kind of pride which uh, which is which has gone out of the place like there's I mean in one way it makes it it makes it nice because there's a kind of you're looking very squarely at a situation but it's also sad you feel like it's a dispirited place any questions we have space and time for two questions just one question there that's it quickly and then we'll wrap up so Kamila when I, I visited Pakistan during the friendship series uh, in 2004 and I had a lot of friends across uh, the border people were colleagues etc what I found was a, we really had a very interesting and uh, you know very high quality debates until I met people who were from army families and then suddenly it became uh, topic was uh, why are you guys mistreating our people living in your country and I didn't get it at first until the guy was kind of pointing out that the Muslims living in India are in some some manner belong to Pakistan and you know that that is that was the strangest feeling apart from that I experienced the most wonderful hospitality in that series and everything is strangers paid for my meals people invited us home on the roads and stuff like that. It was, it was absolutely wonderful camaraderie, but this was the only jarring feeling that I came back with. Hmm. So I hope that is changing uh, now uh, in Pakistan and the army. I think uh, what, what is very promising when you say that army's focus is now shifted from being anti-India to anti-terrorism. That seems more like that. a comment, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I don't think they can possibly... I've been Pakistani uh, all my life and I've never really heard people talk about Indian Muslims as if they're Pakistani. I mean, that, that strikes me as a very odd comment. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's not... It, it doesn't go along with, with conversations I've grown up with. And I think my last observation really is, and I'd just like both of you to, uh, you know, in a lighter vein, why are, the, why are there more novelists right now in Pakistan than there are in India? There seems to be much more writing happening in Pakistan than there is in India. You know, about, about, five, writing, about yes, five, years ago, five years ago, so there was this great talk about the new wave of Pakistani fiction. Yeah. And one of my friends said, well, if five of you are a wave, it only points to what a drought there was before. <laughs> um, listen, Indian fiction, Indian publishing and fiction in English has been, for 30 or more years, has been a deeply establishing to the point that a new Indian novelist, you don't notice in the way that we will notice a new Pakistani right. novelist. It, I, mean, it, I think it's simply untrue that Pakistani fiction has suddenly leapt ahead. I think in the last few years, very exciting things have happened. And I also think that what's happened with India that's really interesting is that non-fiction has really, yeah. I think, in the last few years in terms of books, yeah. um, has really taken off. Yeah. So, I mean, and also that a lot that uh, Pakistani fiction owes a lot to Indian publishing in the Indian publishing infrastructure. There's so many writers who are published here first or here right. only. Um, but no, I, I don't think it's true. That Atish, one last the, comment? The phenomena when it comes to this that I'm much more concerned about, that's much more interesting for me, mm. is that I believe that what's happened in India for the first time is that you have an Indian reading public in English throwing up its own writers. Right. That it doesn't necessarily, the route to being published in India doesn't go through London or New York yeah. anymore. And the quality of people that are thrown up by the Indians on their own is not dazzling. It's in fact extremely <laughs> worrying. <laughs> but, uh, and one, the question in my mind is can India throw up a literary writer in English? Yeah. Is, because where will we be as a culture if we're not it's fine to have the Amish and Chetan and stuff, but are we going to have the other thing coming out of India too? I can see a big headline coming out of there. Thank you very much, both of you. It was delightful. And please do read uh, the letters again when you have a moment. They're, mo they're really wonderful. Thank you.